Greetings and salutations to all of our listeners. And as Christ greeted us many times in the words of peace. And so this is our lesson from the Sunday School Study Manual, Faith Pathway. And we are entering into our winter session. And so hopefully everyone has uh, the uh, updated manuals. And uh, this will be Lesson 1 of Unit 1. And the unit title is The Beginning of a Call. The Beginning of a Call. And this being our first lesson, the title for it is Fulfilling One's Calling. Our devotional reading is Psalms number 102, 102 verses 12 through 22. Our background scriptures are Hebrews, the first chapter, and then the first chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 17. And our printed passage is the first chapter of Hebrews, verses 1 through 5, and Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, and then 16 and 17. And our key verse for this lesson is, In these days he had spoken to us by his Son, whom he had appointed heir to all things, and through him also he made the universe. And that is our key verse, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, I read from the NIV. And our lesson's aims are to grasp the significance of Jesus' earthly heritage and his heavenly origins. And then wonder at the depth and scope of God's eternal plan to bring salvation through Jesus. And our last aim is to worship Jesus as God's definitive word to humanity. God's definitive word to humanity. And this particular lesson, starting our winter season, has two parts to it. <clears throat> and our first part is a rich heritage, extraordinary. And then our second part is a deep heritage, extensive. So we have a rich heritage, it's extraordinary. And then a deep heritage, which is extensive. So as always, we ask that God would bless us with the things that God would have us to know as we indulge ourselves into the study of his word. And then we constantly ask that the spirit of God will compel and convict us that we would not just be hearers of God's word alone, but that we also would be doers of the word. Amen. Our lesson opens in uh, Hebrews, the first chapter in verses 1 through 5. And it, uh, it uses wording which verifies and confirms the intervention of God, the Spirit of God, into the works and into the behavior and into the ordinances and governance of God's people. For it says that God who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke 
in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Saying that in various times, in various places, that there has not been a time where God has not intervened into the welfare of God's creatures, whom are we ourselves the children of the Most High. And when we look at this, the background scripture of our lesson uh, is indeed worthy of our reading, the 102nd Psalm uh, of the book of Psalm and verses 12 through 22. And what we find when we engage into that reading is that it speaks about how the name of our Lord shall endure forever and it will be remembered from generations to generations. And so when it says that it spoke in various times uh, through the voice and the mouthpiece of those prophets that were chosen by God to reveal to God's people God's expectations. And so when we look at the beginning of our lesson, it says to us that this was a form of God's presence and God's intervention into our daily activities and welfare. And it speaks to us about God's timing. God's timing. It tells to us that in the past that God spoke to us by revealed messengers, prophets of God, men that were chosen for a purpose. Uh, the purpose was not to uh, bring recognition to the men that were selected. It wasn't to give them social status or to pump them up, but they were chosen because God wanted to convey a message to God's people. And therefore, God chose men to declare prophecy. God chose men to foretell things that were going to come to pass. And so we learned that this was a form of instructing God's people in the past. But then the text goes on and it tells us that, that God in these last days spoke to us by his son, Christ Jesus, whom he had appointed as heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. Now, uh, we want to look at uh, the last days uh, to uh, distinguish them from sometimes current discussions about these are the last days. And how does that relate to the fulfillment or to the revealing of something that God had already planned in God's eternal planning? Because our lesson uh, opened up and one of the second aims of it was to wonder at the depth and scope of God's eternal plan to bring salvation through Jesus. And when we look uh, in our, uh, when we look at the Holy Writ, God's Word, and uh, we look in Genesis 1 and 14, and it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven 
to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So when we think about God's eternal plan and then uh, we begin to ask ourselves, how is this revealed and how is it staged? How is it actually assigned a particular time to manifest itself? And the scripture tells us that God used the firmament. God used the massive backdrop of the sky filled with stars and heavenly bodies. And then God said, I will let these be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, the days and the years we comprehend, but the signs and the seasons. In the Hebrew text, the word rel- uh, assigned to signs is translated as signals. Signals are sometimes presented in symbolic form. And they reveal to us a underlying message that is manifested in the signal. So it is a form of alerting us to something. It is a a form of uh, revealing to us that this is what this is denoting. This is what this is expressing. And so... Uh, When we speak of the signs or the signals or the forms of alerting, and then we speak of the seasons. In the Hebrew, the seasons, the word used to translate that is uh, defined as appointed times. So God has signals that reveal appointed times where the manifestations, the prophecies, the revelations of God would be fulfilled. And as we begin this winter season and the largest uh, collective celebrating taking place on the birth of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, we know that it was revealed by the heavenly bodies because Scripture tells us that the wise men followed the signal, the sign, and it was the star that was shining in the east. And so... We understand that God had selected wise individuals to recognize when God was about to send an occurrence, a manifestation of revelation onto the face of the earth. And one of the things that is revealed uh, or spoken of out of the 102nd number of Psalms is, is that uh, when we come to the uh, verse 12, it says that the Lord shall endure forever and the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion from the time to favor her. And then it says to us, yes, the set time has come. And I'm going to drop down here uh, to the 18th verse. And it says, this will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven 
the Lord viewed the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner and to release those appointed to death. So when, when, we, when we understand the fulfillment of God's eternal plan, then verse 2 unfolds to us even more uh, un a greater understanding and insight into what God's fulfillment and fullness of God's plan is. For it says that unlike what happened in the past where we were foretold of the things that God was going to do through God's prophets, it says then in these last days, in the fulfillment of God's time, that then he spoke to us by the embodiment of God's self through Christ Jesus. So it said he spoke unto us by his son, whom he had appointed as the heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. And so... The beginning part of our lesson uh, reveals to us the, and it's uh, entitled, The Rich Heritage, and that that heritage is extraordinary. Uh, and then it begins to unfold through us through the written text about how extraordinary it is. And it goes further to reveal and tell us that this son that had been appointed as the heir of all things, uh, it says that whom being the brightness of God's glory, and we in our limited uh, uh, language, uh, and our uh, expression in words, uh, we refer to it as the brightness of God's glory. Uh, and we uh, define this that the Spirit of God was embodied. It was personified in the person of Christ Jesus. And it says the expressed image of his person and upholding of all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty, majesty on high. And uh, to purge something is to cleanse it, is to remove it from guilt is to remove it from moral defilement. And so when we look at the presence of Christ in our midst, uh, just as it said uh, in the book of Matthew that it described uh, Christ's name as Emmanuel, God with us. And what then is God's purpose with us other than to reborn or to rebirth us, to bring us back into the original form to which God created us. And so when we look at, okay, what then was the scope of God's plan, God's eternal plan to bring salvation through Christ. Well, one of the things that we look at is, and the text uh, talked about the power of his word. We, we know from John, the book of John, the first chapter, that it opens by explaining to us the power of God's word. When Christ spoke, what emanated from within Christ and through Christ to us was not just rhetoric. Uh, it wasn't just uh, social conversation. Um, but 
the scripture tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Who is he other than Christ? And so when it says the power of his word, we are talking about the manifestation of the utterance of God in the person of Christ. And its main focus was to bring light into a dark world. And as we read further, and I'm sure everyone is familiar with it, but as we read further into the first chapter of John, it tells us that the light was in the world, but man comprehended it not. And so we recognize the fulfillment of God's eternal plan and how that relates uh, for us. And I want to uh, look at this also because uh, Hebrews makes the distinction of letting us know that and we read this uh, as we go further into verses 4 and 5. Uh, and it tells us that being made so much better than the angels. And he had by inheritance attained a more excellent name than they. And then it says, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So, uh, no angel or no other entity has ever been assailed as being higher than Christ, than having more authority than Christ, uh, as having more power than Christ. And when we look at at this and understand even just the title because Christ certainly is not the surname of Jesus but it is a title and the title of the word Christ simply means the anointed the anointed and the anointed is not uh, something that uh, we uh, can physically or tangibly do. Uh, we relate it to a practice that we're familiar with, and that was the anointing of oil. And so it was a practice, uh, especially when one uh, departed and was deceased. One of the forms of preparing the body was to anoint it with oil and to uh, prepare it for the departure. And so because it was a standard practice that as individuals, as people, we would readily understand how the anointing is applied because the body was fully anointed and prepared for the heavenly uh, uh, dwelling and for being in the presence of God. Well, therefore, when they said Christ was or gave to Jesus the name Christ, Christos, which is a part of um, the uh, preparation of the dead, well, then we would readily understand what they meant by anointing. But Christ anointing was not that uh, not that with oil, but Christ's anointing was that with spirit. Christ was anointed with the spirit of God. And so when we talk about this setting Christ above and beyond the uh, normalcy of people of power, even angels, which simply are messengers of God. But when we look at the distinction of that, we want to go to the uh, book of Colossians. 
Colossians 1, and we will begin at uh, verse 15. And it reads, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Things visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is above all the things that were created through him and for him. And all of the things that were created through him and for him, they all consist because of him. Not they all exist, but they all consist because of him. And he is the head of the body the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. We spoke just a minute ago out of the book of Psalm number 102 about uh, his coming to deliver the dead from their death. And uh, here it tells us that, um, that he is the firstborn from the dead. And when we speak of dead scripturally, we don't always uh, associate it with physical death, but more so spiritual death. And uh, in many cases, the spiritual death is more damaging than the physical death. But it says that in all things, he may have preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness shall dwell. Now, we, we want to just uh, uh, entertain out of that, because that was a mouthful. But we want to just entertain out of that. I want to focus on the part that says, because all things were created through him and for him, that in him all things consist. Because there should be some focus brought to this. Uh, for things to consist, it simply means that things can be present. Things are able uh, to lie or reside. Uh, but one of the most significant parts of the definitions uh, of the word consist is, is that it is the absence of obstructions. The absence of obstructions. So all things lie or all things reside or all things are present because of the Spirit of Christ who renders us free from obstructions. Things that entangle us, things that uh, uh, impede our flow, things that keep us from being the manifestation to whom God created us to be. So when we look at what scripture is saying unto us, uh, we are to focus on the significance of God's eternal plan to bring Christ in our midst. And what was God thinking about? when God did that. And so our uh, uh, last part of our lesson, and this will be good for us to read and to revisit the application of Scripture with reference to the lineage that uh, was spoken of into the second part of our lesson, the deep heritage. Uh, when we uh, uh, read through this, the genealogy here, uh, Matthew reveals this from the royal or from the legal line, 
of the genealogy of Christ. And then Luke refers to it from the collateral or the particular line of genealogy or lineage. And a good way to understand the application of this would be to read a couple of scriptures which kind of bring us into the social content of how heritage and lineage was explained among Israel at the time of Moses. In, in the book of Numbers, and uh, that's an appropriate title for the book because now the 12 tribes of Israel are being decreed with how they would set up their camps, their societies, their order, uh, how uh, the wealth would be distributed from one tribe to another, how that wealth would filter down through the communities, what would be the order, and how would the wealth be passed on from one generation to the next generation, and also who would be the uh, authorities over the distribution of the wealth. And so it is, it dispels or it reveals to us uh, a situation that occurred, uh, which uh, we can uh, 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 attach to the two distinctions uh, between Matthew's list of genealogy and that of Luke. Uh, there a situation arose uh, which was brought to uh, Moses and the priest. And there was an individual, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, is uh, Zelophead, Zelophead, who was from the lineage of Manasseh, uh, the son of Joseph. And in this case, this man had five daughters and he had no sons. And during that time, and unfortunately, this is still a custom uh, in other parts of the earth. But during that time, the wealth, the inheritance of whatever wealth a family had was given unto the sons. And the daughters uh, pleaded unto Moses that uh, why should the wealth that our father has developed that our father has inquired, why should that be taken from us and given to the tribe to whom we belong? Why should it be distributed to others instead of unto us simply because we are women and our father had no sons? And Shouldn't that wealth that our father obtained, if it's going to be given to the tribe and they are not, uh, uh, they are not immediate members of the, uh, of the offspring of our father, but since it would be distributed among the wealth of the tribe, shouldn't it therefore be given unto us who are the daughters of our father? And so when we look at this and we discuss about uh, inheritance and uh, one of the things that Matthew and Luke establish is how Christ ascended to the king uh, as they try and mocked Christ to be the king of the Jews or the forecoming of the Messiah, in order for that to have taken place, in order for in moral issues, in earthly interventions, in order for us to acknowledge who Christ was, it had to fit the um, 
moral customs and laws that have been established on a earthly plane to give validation to something that God established on a heavenly plane. And so Matthew takes it from Abraham, the father of the Hebrew nation, and brings it all the way through up to Christ. But Luke takes it from Adam all the way up to Christ. But Joseph, who it, scripture says was espoused to Mary, was engaged to Mary. Uh, Joseph was the son-in-law of Heli. Heli was Mary's father. And in the culture of the day, and is somewhat still uh, a practice uh, now, uh, but many times we don't refer to our in-laws as in-laws. We say, that's my son, that's my daughter. When our offspring marries to another family, we say they are family, not in-laws, which is a benefit to both of us who have engaged now as a larger family. So in the text from Luke, Luke identifies the lineage through Mary's side from her father, Heli, and then Joseph is rendered as the son of Heli. So in one hand, Joseph is rendered from the lineage of David and from Jacob, but then that's in the text of Matthew, but then we come into Luke and we reach a moment of confusion and saying, well, wait a minute, how can Joseph died be Jacob, but then over in Luke, Joseph's dad is Heli. So here is the distinction. And it is for one of the very few times that the lineage is traced to the female member of the family and not the male. But greater than this is not just uh, for it to be uh, proper and appropriate according to the governance uh, established on earthly planes. But it is also the fulfillment of God's purpose on a heavenly plane. Now we hope that something uh, has been shared uh, that gives us insight into what God would have us to understand in Scripture. And as always, as we open, we close. We hope that we will be compelled or convicted by the Spirit, that we would not just be hearers of the Word alone, but doers as well. God bless you, and God keep you is our prayer.